What do parents of missing children sound like? I'm Deception Detective. I'm an attorney trained in statement analysis, and this channel exists to expose lies and manipulation. Before we proceed, please hit the like, subscribe, and notification bell. In today's video, we're going to analyze a segment of an interview the McCanns did with Piers Morgan to see if we can identify signs that they're actually parents of a missing child. Or like I personally theorize, if you've seen my other analyses of the McCann, if you've seen this entire playlist, that they are actually responsible for Madeline's death. So let's watch this segment of the interview. I have not watched it yet, so we'll be watching it together and uh, see what we can pick up. Most expertise in these types of stranger or, or stereotypical kidnappings. What Ernie says and it's stuck with us is, until you know who's taken your daughter, you don't know. And you can think of a whole host of scenarios. And I think that he's given us some examples. When Elizabeth Smart was abducted at knife point from her bedroom, uh, which she shared with her sister, he says, there's no way we could have known that she would be living just miles from home. Um, JC Dugard, I mean, all of these cases, who could have imagined it? So if you've seen my playlist about the McCanns, you know that I think the parents are actually responsible for Madeline's death. And a good video topic would be actually analyzing statements made by the parents of Amy Smart, or um, the second girl he said there, or even Cleo Smith, a girl who went missing about two years ago, whose parents didn't make the best statement possible, but you could still tell that they were actually parents of missing children. So I might actually drop that a link to that video in the member section of my channel if you are a member. Uh, if you're not a member, please uh, consider joining up. You get a badge to show how long you've been a member. It shows up when you make comments or comment in the live chat. And you also get some custom emojis you can use. And I'm adding three more um, in, a, in a couple of days. So please consider becoming a member of the channel. There's no way we could have known that she would be living just miles from home. Um, J.C. Dugard, I mean, all of these. Right, so Amy Smart, J.C. Dugard, Cleo Smith, I think is a really good one, specifically because they are Australian parents. Lots of comments I get on these McCann videos are, you know, uh, Jerry Scottish, he speaks English differently than you might expect. Really, that's not the case. English is English. I lived in the U.K. for years. Um uh, there's some slang differentiation, but as far as statement analysis goes, it's the exact same analysis. Whether you're American, Australian, Canadian, from New Zealand, it's English. But this would be a nice video series here to actually look at the statements of parents whose children are confirmed to have gone missing. Uh, let me know in the comments if you'd like to see that comparison. But for now, let's focus on the McCann's. Of these cases, who could have imagined it? So we've got to be completely open-minded as to who's taken her and why. And I, I don't think we'll know until we find that person. One of the things I struck by in the book is, is your quite open account of what it's done to your marriage, this. So this is where we left off in the last video we did. I mean, do you feel that you've been quite fortunate to stay together? Do you think this could have split up many couples? I think that's without doubt really I mean it's such a major event to happen to your life and the consequences and ramifications and notice how she says it's a major event an event is a completed thing right so when someone gets hit by a car that's the event right if someone gets hit by a car but they survive but they're disabled for life that's an ongoing issue right kind of like a missing child if your kid dies, it is a traumatizing event. If your kid is kidnapped, the trauma is continuing. The event is incomplete until you retrieve your child or um, recover a body. And this isn't the first time they've referred to Madeline's disappearance as a completed um, event where they can get catharsis and move on. That is not how the parents of missing children actually speak. It's a massive. So listen again. Listen to the completeness. Right? It was an event. It was a bad event. Now it's over. 
if your child is actually missing and you're not certain what happened to them, it is never over. Not until you know that your child is alive and you recover them or until you recover their body. Many couples. I think that's without doubt, really. I mean, it's such a major event to happen to your life and the consequences and ramifications are massive. And we're very fortunate, you know, we we had a strong relationship before. We've got a great family and really good friends who have supported us, but everyone has that. And as you know, the statistics will show that most marriages break down in circumstances like that. This is something I pointed out in previous videos. Parents of missing children or even children who die prematurely often end up getting divorced or having a very strained relationship because there's that underlying blame of each other, right? Well, you had the idea to leave them sleeping in the room. Well, you were too cheap to get a nanny, right? Uh, or you wanted to go to Portugal. So the bickering is something you expect when your child is kidnapped, even if we believe their story, right? If their child was kidnapped because they were a little bit negligent or even very negligent, depending on what your opinion is of leaving a three-year-old and two baby twins alone in a bedroom. So the bickering is to be expected with a kidnapped child, the blame, the blame game. However, if you and your spouse committed murder together, now you are tied together for life because if either of you turns on the other one, both of you go down. And I feel like that is the case with the McCants. In every interview, they appear together. Any Everyone that I've seen, I've actually seen some comments from you guys saying that uh, there are some interviews of them doing an interview separately, which I am very interested in checking out. So I will probably look at those ones um, as the next interviews I do in this series. Because as you know, I believe that lots of their story is scripted, that they came up with it together. And one way that you can unravel a scripted story is looking for inconsistencies between the two conspirators, right? Our conspirators. So that is one way to unravel a scripted story. So that is next on my docket of things to look at, individual interviews, if they have done any. And in the comments, you guys have told me they have. So if you actually have a link to one of those, please send it to me on X and I will check it out. But for now, they're talking to peers about the statistics of people getting divorced after their child goes missing or a child dies. Those rates are very high. The fact that they are not divorced yet and don't even bicker at all, it seems like, is a red flag. At its worst, what, what's it been like trying to have a relationship through this? It's been incredibly difficult and... Um... I think, as you can see from the footage and other things, I found my feet much quicker than Kate and was able to put away a lot of the images of Madeline and sort of compartmentalise them and, and almost take a conscious aspect that thinking about the worst wasn't helping me and it, it wasn't helping the search. And there's been times where you are, you know, you're just managing to keep your own head above the water. Oh my God. If you know my theory about the McCann's, if you've seen this playlist, you know, since very early on, this is the first video I did about them two weeks ago. Very early on, based on the leakage that the McCann's have, right? So based on the things they say, the slips of the tongue, um, their word choice, you can tell what's really on someone's mind. Right? This is known as leakage. And when you're under stress, the leakage is exacerbated. Right, So you actually leak more. And we've seen examples of me actually leaking my thoughts about the McCann's. So if you're, new, if you're new to this video series, I'll just bring you to the table with a quick recap. I believe that Madeline's parents, in my opinion, over-sedated her on the night that she died. So they gave her too much sedative. She died. Jerry uh, was there when she passed away or, or was the one who recognized that she was dead. And I think Kate administered the sedative. 
Then, based on their word choice, specifically words regarding water, I came to the belief that they disposed of Madeline's body somewhere cold, likely in a body of water or in a cave or somewhere uh, deep and cold. Even a construction site is possible in wet cement, something like that, right? So somewhere deep and cold. And we've seen many instances of leakage of strange word choice regarding that. For example, in a previous video, Jerry said, uh, the pain is never far from the surface. And what has a surface? A body of water. Or he mentioned that the kidnappers may have had boats, which unless there were SEAL Team 6 coming in to kidnap Madeline and zoom back out onto their boat and, and you know, like uh, like drug runners in the 80s, right, on a speedboat head to Spain, the mention of boats is bizarre, right? If this was a little cat burglar criminal, there'd be no reason to mention boats. And then he also mentioned thermal cameras, right? He expected the police to have thermal cameras, which is a strange thing to say, because a thermal camera would not necessarily help you find a little girl walking along the street or in someone's house, because it would just look like a little girl and her mom or her father or her parents, right? It wouldn't be um, strange. However, a thermal camera would highlight something in a cold area before the heat can dissipate from the dead body. So I think these things were on his mind and these are leakage. Also in the comments, many of you pointed out many other instances of leakage. So I've, in one video, maybe we'll do a live stream. I want to highlight all your comments maybe in a Q&A video, the ones that really caught my eye. Because since I'm doing this analysis on the fly, I'm not going to catch every little nuance. However, many of you, especially the members of my channel, have seen lots of my videos and are extremely skilled in picking up uh, leakage and have actually picked up instances of leakage that I didn't catch on my first listen. So that, all that is to say, listen to what Jerry says here. And I believe this is more leakage indicating that Maddie was buried at sea or in a body of water or somewhere cold, somewhere with a surface where if you put her in there, she will go below it. All right, so let's listen. It wasn't helping me and it, it wasn't helping the search. And there's been times where you are... Yeah, you're just managing to keep your own head above the water. And when you I think this is one of the biggest examples of leakage we've seen yet with the McCanns. And I cannot believe the investigators would not have picked up on this. I think the Portuguese police heard phrases like this and believed the McCanns were guilty just based on this sort of obvious leakage, which is why the investigation was lackluster. So let's listen again. Notice how he says, I can barely keep my own head above water. He's, he's painting the picture. He's leaking something about a head, not his own, going below water, right? This is, in my opinion, very strong leakage. Of the images of Madeline and sort of compartmentalize them and, and almost take a... Also, he noted, he talks about a head going below water while he's trying to keep his head above the water right after mentioning uh, images of Madeline and compartmentalizing those images. So images of Madeline are on his brain right before he talks about keeping his head above water. Right? Did he wade into the water and maybe with her in a suitcase, right, a compartment and, and make sure that she, and filled with rocks perhaps and make sure that it sank down. Um, right, like I say, just because someone has leakage does not mean 100% that's exactly what happened. However, if we go through and highlight every instance of water-related phrases that are slightly out of place, it starts to paint a picture. So let's listen again. Notice how he's talking about images of Madeline. And right after that, he talks about barely being able to keep his head above water. 
much quicker than Kate and was able to put away a lot of the images of Madeline and sort of compartmentalise them and, and almost take a conscious aspect that thinking about the worst wasn't helping me and it, it wasn't helping the search. And there's been times where you are, you know, you're just managing to keep your own head above the water. And above the water. Also, the phrase is, I'm barely able to keep my head above water. Not the water. The water implies you're speaking out about a specific body of water. Right? Like, um, it indicates he's thinking about a specific body of water if we really dig into this, if we did a deep dive into the precise words he used. For now, we'll just leave it as this is another example of water-related imagery. And like I always say when I bring up leakage, is it conclusive? No, of course not. Because if I were 100% conclusive about the things I say, you sh that should be a red flag to you that I am a hoaxer, right? Just like how the, the McCants are so conclusive that someone kidnapped their daughter. That is a sign of a hoaxer. If you're unsure, if you're trying to get to the truth, all possibilities should be open. And I'm leaving all possibilities open. However, I'm stacking up my pile of poker chips and I'm betting more and more now that they are guilty and I'm placing some side bets on the idea that Madeline died by a sedative and that her body was disposed of in the water. And could I be wrong? Yes. Could I lose all my chips? Yes. However, these are the calculations I would be making if I were in charge of the investigation. Right? If they brought me on as a private investigator to find their daughter and gave me a budget of $100,000, most of that budget would be going to sending people along the coastline are looking in the water within a day's drive from the hotel, are any cave complexes. So that is how statement analysis can guide you and deception detection can actually guide you in a real world scenario. If all options are open and they're saying it was a kidnapper, I'm not going to waste my budget on hunting down a kidnapper, maybe a small allocation. Most of my budget, based on what I've seen here from these three interviews we analyzed with the McCanns, is going to go to searching cold areas, bodies of water, uh, things where the Portuguese police seem to have been distracted from by the, the McCanns' insistence that a, an abductor took their daughter. And when you're trying to get support, and this is a two-way thing, and you didn't, you, you know, I feel terrible now. Also, let's listen. I, th I feel like there's a little bit more leakage in what he said there. Right? So he talked about com uh, compartmentalizing Madeline. So maybe he actually put her body into a compartment, into the boot of a car, right? The trunk of a car, or into a suitcase, Also, if you're thinking, hey, I don't leak this much. When I'm lying, I, I, I pick my words perfectly. I don't leak anything. Leakage occurs when you're under more stress. That's why so much leakage is happening with the McCants, because they're doing a live interview. They're being filmed. They have to coordinate their story with each other. This is 2011, so they've given plenty of other interviews, so they actually have to make sure that their story can coordinates with other um, times they've told this story, right? So they can't contradict each other. They can't contradict themselves in the past. They have to watch Piers' reaction to make sure that he's buying what they're saying. They have to be aware of their facial expressions, their tone of voice, the words they use. And when you're lying by omission, you actually have to edit out things that you saw, like for example, Madeline's dead body. And when you're lying by commission, you actually have to fabricate facts like the open window or the kidnapper. And this is why it's so complicated to lie, especially with a co-conspirator, right? Because you have to coordinate so many things and it's the perfect storm for leakage. So, for example, if you think, hey, I never leak, then I would say make up a story. And what I would do is I would ask you to recite it to me backwards Right, so tell me the most recent thing that happened and go backwards. And then I would ask you unexpected questions along the way. Right? Well, what color was the shopping cart? If you didn't do the shoplifting, um, 
you know, uh, where did you park? Which parking space did you park in? Unexpected questions, telling your story backward, basically adding more cognitive load to you. And believe me, you will leak things. And if you've seen the previous videos, you know that I've, I've actually leaked my opinion of Madeline myself on the channel. And this is a very low stress environment for me. I have a relationship through this. It's been incredibly difficult. And um, I think, as you can see from the footage and other things, I found my feet much quicker than Kate. Found my feet. Found my feet. Are we look? Could I be looking too much into this? Yes, but finding my feet, I'm picturing someone wading into the water with their pants rolled up. Could I be totally wrong on that? Yes. Could I be right? Yes. Would it help me allocate my budget if I were a private investigator looking for Madeline? Yes. Right. All these things can be true. It and was able to put away a lot of the images of Madeline put away a lot of the images of Madeline. So not block out the images or suppress the images, but put away. What do you put away? You, you put away luggage in an overhead compartment. Uh, you put away things in the trash, right? In the rubbish. Could she be in a trash bag? Possibly. <laughs> and sort of compartmentalize them and, and almost take a conscious compartment. So could she be in a trash bag thrown into the back of a car and driven to the water and he takes the trash bag out and wades into the water and makes sure it stays under? Yes, totally possible. Does the leakage indicate that? Uh, from here, one or two percent, a slight bit of leakage lends that sort of opinion, right, to, to me. And if you've seen my earlier videos, you know that leakage can be surprisingly accurate. So for example, with Liver King, we noticed leakage. And then we had the denouement, right, where he admitted he took steroids. And if you go watch those videos, there's actually things he say that indicate exactly what he was doing through leakage, but I didn't pick up on them because I wasn't a finely attuned to that level of leakage because I didn't know the, the details. But when you watch again, you see more and more leakage. I was picking up the very basic leakage, which led me to the correct conclusion. But there's actually even more leakage in what he was saying. So here at the McCann's, let's say we found Madeline's body in uh, shallow water in a trash bag loaded down with rocks. Then we would go back, we would see this leakage, and we'd say, okay, that's what he was picturing, what he was trying to suppress when he was giving this answer. Right? So leakage is fascinating. It's almost like uh, a Rorschach test. Right? You can interpret it a bunch of different ways. Uh, like finding my feet could mean nothing. It could just be an expression he's using. But it could also be a leakage of him picturing something regarding feet. Uh, so it's very difficult, which is why I like to see multiple instances of leakage regarding a certain subject. So, for example, we've seen lots of phrases regarding surfaces of water. I keep my head above water. The pain is never very far from the surface. The kidnapper might have had a boat. Uh, the police might have had a thermal detector. Uh, that's a ton to do with the ocean and water, which is why I'm harping on it so much. Everything else is just me putting the idea out there and seeing if we recognize any other leakage that lines up with that. For example, compartment is a new bit of leakage we just picked up on now. But if we go back and watch the other videos again, I wonder if we would see some more instances of him talking about compartments when he's talking about Maddie. This aspect that thinking about the worst wasn't helping me and it, it wasn't helping the search and there's been times where you are you know, you're just managing to keep your own head above the water and when you right, you're just managing to keep your own head above the water i managed to keep my head above water that is an actual expression now out of all the expressions he used he could have used that's when he picked and then he said the water which is interesting Could it be totally benign? Of course. 
Could it be more examples of guilty leakage? Yes. Right? That's why we keep track of every instance. When you're trying to get support, and this is a two-way thing, and you didn't, you, you know, I feel terrible now looking back, but there were times when I couldn't support Kate because I thought, I'm going to go under. Uh, going to go under, right? underwater. It's the, the conceit of water in all of his expressions. Right? The pain is never far from the surface. I can't keep my head above water. I'm going to go under. I can't support Kate. Either of you ever get suicidal? No, I mean, I, I don't think I was ever suicidal, but I often wished my life would be over. Um, you know, I'd never have planned anything or done anything. I knew that wasn't a you know, possibility, that wasn't an option. But, uh, you know, so much pain that I used to think about, God, let's just pull the duvet over and I won't wake up tomorrow. I mean, Jerry hinted there that there have been times when he's been, he feels bad now about being unable to support you. That must have been a particularly difficult period for you when even Jerry couldn't seem to provide any comfort for you. It was. I mean, you know, there were times when I just wanted to be held or something. Um, but I equally, I know that there were times when I couldn't support like my mum and dad, for example, because um, we've all suffered in this. And I guess you have to make sure that you're afloat in order Afloat. So I know they're going on about this, the conceit, right? The, the metaphor that Jerry made about sticking above water. But listen to how long it's going on, right? This metaphor is something that, that they both like, right? So now she's talking about staying afloat. I can barely keep my own head above water. Um, and now Kate, right? I, I have to stay afloat. What did she say? Right? Lots of imagery around water. This is the most we've seen so far. And we've been noticing the water references since the very first McCann's video I did, I think, right? And here we go, even more of it. Support like my mum and dad, for example, because um, we've all suffered in this. And I guess you have to make sure that you're afloat in order to be able to support somebody else. And, it, you know, that works both yeah. ways. And we are very fortunate that we've had, you know, really close family that can support us at those times. We're going to have another short break. When we come back, I want to talk to you about the diary that you've kept and how cathartic that may have been for you, how helpful. It's interesting that Pierce says that's cathartic because catharsis is something that happens when a very tragic thing um, occurs and is final and then you process it and you get some catharsis, like your child dies. If your child is still missing, there is no catharsis ever, which is why it's so tormenting and, and uh, one of the worst, probably the worst thing that could ever happen to a mother and a father, right? Because you don't know what your child is going through. Whereas as sad as it is, if the child is, if, if you know for a fact that the child is dead, obviously your life will be changed forever. But you know that the child is not suffering anymore. Whereas if they're missing, they could be suffering every day. You don't know who has them. And that is the torturous portion. And that is why there is no catharsis. Parents of missing children search their entire lives. There is no catharsis. Um, so it is interesting that Pierce used the, words, uh, used the word catharsis. I think even he suspects that they may have done it. And if you've seen my Hans Neiman video or uh, watched the other segments of this video with Piers where I've analyzed the McCanns, right? We, we've broken this interview up into four parts. This is the fourth part now. Um, you'll know that I, I like Piers. I, he's not a dumb guy. I think he can also sense uh, the deception here, which is why he used the word catharsis. We're doing everything we can, Madeline, to find you. So, for example, let's say Kate says, yes, this did give me some catharsis. That's a red flag, right? It's more leakage that she knows that Madeline is dead. And Piers will have walked her right into that trap. And there's so many good and very kind people helping us. Be brave, sweetheart. Our only Christmas wish is for you to be back with us again. And we're hoping and praying that that will happen. Love you, Madeline. How hard is it for you to, to see 
video footage of Madeline, even now? I think it's the one medium that really brings her back to me in particular. Um, seeing her moving and um, her voice and and it's our Madeline as opposed to the iconic picture of Madeline, the missing child. It's our daughter and uh, and sometimes we just go and put the video on and sit and watch it with the kids as well. You're both religious people and you had a, a, a private meeting with the Pope. What was that like for you, Kate? It's interesting. I saw lots of comments about those people telling me that the McCanns met with the Pope. Um, I don't know how the Pope would help them retrieve their daughter. Like, I think it brings more attention to the case. But also, the more attention you bring to a missing child, the more likely that the kidnappers are either going to A, send you a ransom note to try to get some money because the heat is on and they know they're being looked for, or they will just dispo murder the kid and dispose the body to eliminate any evidence because there's so much heat on them. So visiting the Pope is strange unless it's because they feel guilty for what they've done and they're asking for forgiveness. And I feel like that was the real purpose of the visit to the Pope. They are experiencing extreme guilt for negligently murdering their daughter and this is some form of relief to them, right? To, to get forgiveness from the Pope or even to, you know, maybe hear some soothing words from the Pope about their daughter in the afterlife. But if she is kidnapped, the visit to the Pope doesn't necessarily make logical sense. Well, at that point, it was just incredibly important. I mean, I truly believed why was it incredibly important? Even if you went there to get more attention to the case, by the time you're meeting with the, with the Pope, you have a lot of attention already in order to get that appointment with the Pope. So a incredibly important, uh, getting more publicity is not incredibly important at that point. Like it could be, but personally I feel like to them, incredible importance would be getting forgiveness or maybe having the Pope uh, act as a medium for them to talk to their daughter in the afterlife, something along those lines. That would make a difference for Madeline. Um, and I've often described it as the next step, really, the closest you can get to kind of meeting God in some way. And I just thought all my... The closest you can get... I think that was a slip up. I think that's the closest you can get to Madeline. Just like I said, I predicted, right? Either that he forgive, it was for forgiveness or to act as a medium to sort of, um, for them to commune with Madeline who is in the afterlife. And I think Kate just sort of indicated that it was the second, right? That meeting with the Pope was the closest they could get to Madeline who is now in, in heaven, right? In the spirit world. And I've often described it as the next step, really, the closest you can get to kind of meeting God in some way. And I just thought all my prayers, etc., would be channeled more quickly to God. What did he say? To Interesting, right? I think they were using the Pope to try to channel, to try to communicate with Madeline. And this Pope, yeah. which Pope is this? Is it John Paul? He just, just very simply took a photograph of Madeline and placed his palm on it and blessed her. And he just said, I'll continue to pray for Madeline's safe return and for all your family. Has what's happened to you damaged your faith? It's challenged. If that is, uh, if that is John Paul, great. But if that was uh, Ratzinger, didn't Ratzinger have the scandal of being exposed as knowing about priests um, diddling children in the, in the Roman Catholic church. So him meeting with them about a young girl may have also benefited him, his image as a kind of virtue signaling that, you know, the church cares about little children. 
when in reality, I think he had to step down, right, because of that scandal, because it was exposed that he actually had direct knowledge of people high up in the church doing inappropriate things with young boys and covering it up. So if that was Ratzinger, um, it's almost like two people with guilty consciences, the McCanns about their daughter and him about the church's relationship with young children, uh, were able to coordinate their virtue signaling into this uh, meeting, which is interesting. But I, I couldn't tell. It looked like a little bit like Ratzinger to me. This interview happened in 2011. I don't know when they met with the Pope, though. It's my faith. I mean, there's no doubt about that, really. Um, I'm sure someone will let me know in the comments, though. Adeline, safe return and for all your family. Has what's happened to you damaged your faith? It's challenged my faith. I mean, there's no doubt about that, really. Um, I'm still there. You know, I've still got my faith, but there have been times, and particularly back in, I'd say, 2008 was my, my worst year, where, you know, I'm not embarrassed to say I felt angry with God. Um, I couldn't understand why all this had happened, not Madeline being taken, because I don't believe that was the will of God, um, but everything that had happened subsequently. And the fact that... Interesting. So she was angry at God, but not about Madeline being taken. So what was she angry about? She was more angry about them being blamed by the media, which is a very self-centered approach for someone whose daughter is allegedly experiencing who knows what at the hands of a kidnapper. And they reflect that in these interviews they do too. So they want us to believe that Madeline was kidnapped. However, they never express any concern for what Madeline is going through right now, um, you know, or even describing Madeline. You know, if you see her now, this is an age progressed photo. This is what she should look like. If you're a little girl out there and you look like this, you might be Madeline. Please call us, right? Or if you see a girl with this unique pupil shape, please call us. Or Madeline, if you're watching TV right now, we love you. Um, and we're still searching for you. Or if you have Madeline, we have a fund, we will pay you. Just let us know what you want, right? You never see any, um, any sort of activity or pleas or demonstration of concern that lines up with their story. In reality, they're much more focused on themselves and making sure that they direct the narrative in the direction they want it to be directed, which is that some unknown third party kidnap Madeline. And as I mentioned in my previous McCann's video, I have many comments of people saying, well, if they're guilty, why would they do so many interviews? Why constantly be in the press? And that's kind of like how uh, murderers join the search parties for the victims. They want to be able to influence the direction of the investigation, right? They want to be involved. The McCanns are petrified, in my opinion, of losing control of the narrative. So they need to make sure that everyone believes someone kidnapped Madeline and that they're innocent, lest the fingers start pointing at them. So they need to constantly write books, be in the media, and constantly be directing the narrative and shutting down anyone who questions the narrative. Particularly back in, I'd say, 2008 was my, my worst year, where, you know, I'm not embarrassed to say I felt angry with God. Um, I couldn't understand why all this had happened, not Madeline being taken, because I don't believe that was the will of God. Right, so she was angry at God, but not about Madeline being taken. Why? Because Madeline wasn't taken. She's probably angry at God about herself, right? Um, how could you have let Madeline die? Um, we gave her that amount of sedative every night. Why, why this night? Will of God. Um, but everything that has happened subsequently, and the fact that we just we just felt so many challenges, and particularly in Portugal, where I felt we really needed help. I really wanted someone to stand up and say, this is all wrong, we'll help you. Um, and I guess I, you know, I, I threw that back at God really and said, why are you allowing all of this to happen? You know, we can handle so much, but this just seems too much. And Joe, do you still keep Madeline's room uh, as it always was? 
Yeah, I mean, it's a lot more, um, a lot more stuff in it now. Lots of presents and things, but I mean, I've pretty much kept it. Um, I'm less sentimental about it. I have to say. What a strange admission. I think, um, but Kate finds it particularly comforting going in there. It's busy, and, and Sean and Ham, we like. It. When someone dies, then you're sentimental. When you're saying that the kid was kidnapped and may still be out there, then you're basically, you should be saying, I'm less hopeful, which is an extremely strange thing to say. So the fact that he's talking about sentimentality is another bit of leakage that they know she's already dead. Right? If your daughter's out there potentially undergoing who knows what at the hands of who knows who, right? Some crazy person could be um, torturing her. That has nothing to do with sentimentality. You have sentimentality about something that's gone now that you used to like. So the fact that he's saying he's less sentimental means that he is experiencing some sentimentality about Madeline and that Kate is really experiencing a lot of sentimentality about Madeline. That's not the emotion you feel when your kid who you should have been protecting is kidnapped. You, the the thing to say in that case would be if you're talking about not keeping her room for her is I'm less hopeful that she'll be found. Right? Because they're talking about keeping her room the same for when she's found. Like going in, they always go in and say, Can we borrow one of Madeline's teddy bears? And all. How have they dealt with it? <sighs> Brilliantly. Mm. Um, and we've always been as honest as we could be with them. And that was certainly the advice we were given. What, what do they think happened to Madeline? Well, they know that a man has taken her. Um, so what did they have to leave out, right? So she said, we've been as honest. And they said this earlier, and I pointed it out. So when uh, they said this in another interview um, with a Spanish uh, TV station, right? So the, the interviewer asked them, what have you told the twins? And they said, we've been as honest as, and then they left out, you know, as we could be. So let's say, so here they said we've been as honest as we could be. And let's say that was just a benign statement. So that means that the kids are too young to know that Madeline was kidnapped, right? That would be the part that you left out, right? Well, Madeline's taking a trip, right? Or Madeline's at grandma and grandpa's house. That would be the part you leave out, that she's been kidnapped by some scary man. But they're saying that they told the twins that part. So which part would they be leaving out, right? If they're being as honest as they can be, instead of just saying we've told them everything, if they're being as honest as they can be and they've told the twins about the kidnapping, then what's left to leave out? What could be worse than the kidnapping that you would have to um, edit out of your story to the twins? Probably that mommy and daddy did it, right? That you actually over-sedated her, over -sedated her and she's dead and then you, you took and hid the body. So just listen to how strange this is, right? We've been as honest as we can be, but then she admits they've told the children about the kidnapping. Ask yourself, so what is being left out then? What is worse than the kidnapping? Because they, they say in their own words that they have left something out, right? They didn't say we've told them everything or we've been honest with them. They said we've been as honest as we can be, implying something's edited out and the kidnapping is not the part they edited out comforting and in there it's busy and, and Sean and Anne we like going in they always go in and say can we borrow one of Madeline's teddy bears and all how have they dealt with it <sighs> brilliantly mm. um, and we've always been as honest as we could be with them and that was certainly the advice we were given what, what do they think happened to Madeline so even Pierce is expecting them to say that they left out the kidnapping portion right what do they think happened but then Kate says they've told them about the kidnapping which is not what's expected, right? I was, actually, I was surprised when she said that right here, right? That's why I paused and rewound. This was not what I was expecting to hear. I was expecting her to say, well, they think Madeline's at grandma's or Madeline's um, at a boarding school, right? Some lie about the kidnapping because that should be the part that you edit out if you're going to edit something out. Well, they know that a man has taken her um, and they know that that's wrong. Um, they know that we're all looking, all looking for lots of people. All right, so what was edited out then? That means the twins don't know the full story. 
And this is a story that the McCanns want everyone to believe too. Right? So even with the public, they're being as honest as they can be. They've told the twins the exact same thing they've told everyone else. But by her own admission, that is not the full truth. That is simply as honest as they can be. People are helping us. Looking at Sean and Amley, though, you wouldn't know that the major trauma has happened in their lives. And Also, let's say this was the only thing they said, right? Like, uh, we just started watching here. Would that mean they're guilty? No, of course not. Right. So I just want to point out this caveat. I try to do it every video. One sign of deception does not mean someone's lying. Right? We look for multiple signs of deception. And at this point, we've analyzed three interviews across. This is the seventh video on the McCanns. So when I say something with a very strong opinion at this point, it's because we've seen lots of examples to support that opinion by now. Right. If you go back and watch, which I suggest you do, watch this playlist from the beginning. This is the first video, how to analyze a suspect. To here, you'll see the development of the opinions. They can talk about, you know, even on holiday last week, and they meet little kids, and they talk about brothers and sisters, and they say, oh, well, we've got a big sister, Madeline, but she's missing, and we're looking for her, and they talk about the wristbands. Today would have been her eighth birthday. I mean, every part of you just be, must be wondering what she looks like now, apart from anything else, how you would have celebrated the day. I mean, do you, do you commemorate the day? Will you do anything with the other two children? How, how do you deal with a birthday when she's not there? Well, what we've done the last few few years, we have marked the day. You know, we've had like a, just a small sort of birthday tea, really, with close family and friends. Um, this year's obviously different with the launch of the book and stuff, so we're very busy. I mean, it's hard. I find it hard to think, well, I've got an eight-year-old daughter, you know, and as you say, what does she look like? And I do try and imagine her and make her taller and stuff. And But it's hard, you know, because... We should be we should be with her, you know, celebrating the birthday together. So, in many ways, I think uh, yeah, launching the book today is a good thing to do on her birthday. It's doing something positive. It's re-energising the search. We've launched a campaign, as you said, with News International to get a review. And I think these are milestones that you pass, and you know there's going to be media attention irrespective. So, it's always a good time from our point of view to capitalise on that. Um, we just got to find them, really. After the break, we'll talk specifically about how people watching this can possibly help you and to see also where you think the, the focus of investigation should now be. All right, so these are two good questions coming up. I like that they're open-ended. So what the McCanns say can reveal a lot. So let's listen to the responses. For example, let's listen to the questions... And we've done this before, right? When peers ask them, you know, do you blame the hotel at all? I predicted they would say no. Because blaming the hotel is counter narrative. It goes against their narrative, their hoax, that an unknown, undiscoverable third party broke in and stole Madeline and disappeared into the night. Right? That's why we know it's not our friends. We know it's not the hotel. Basically, we know it's not anyone who, if we accuse them, will point the finger back at us and expose us. So let's listen to these questions and let's predict how a hoaxer would respond to these questions and we'll see if we get it right. And if you don't follow me on X, um, I suggest following me there. I add notes there as well. And if you've seen my videos or you follow me on X, you know that these are the four signs of a hoaxer. Conclusiveness, so the McCants are conclusive that someone kidnapped their daughter. There is zero room for any other uh, explanation. Vagueness regarding the money shot. In, in the case of Madeline McCann, the money shot is the night she went missing. When they recount searching the room or looking for her, they're always vague. And in fact, their story sounds scripted. Then there's reticence regarding the money shot. So in the McCann's case, the money shot is, again, Madeline going missing. And in each interview, when they talk, when Kate gets to the part where she has to describe um, discovering that Madeline is gone and describing the open window, she lingers on every detail leading up to that point, right? And then skips fast it quickly and moves on to the next segment of the story. 
And so she's reticent about talking about that part of the story, which makes me believe that that is where the lie is. And finally, hoaxers are emotionless. And by emotionless, I mean regarding reported emotion. So a hoaxer can act sad or whatever they need to act like in an interview. And that is actually how they deceive body language people, which is one reason I don't put much credence into body language personally. We've evolved to communicate with our language. So I prefer to listen to people's words. So they can act sad, um, downcast, etc. However, what they do is they fail to report the appropriate emotions when they're recounting a story. And even here, right, we've seen they're failing to report their appropriate emotions of the parents of a missing child. If they really believe Madeline's missing, like I said, we should expect them to be talking about how they want to find her, um, their curiosity about what she's going through, uh, their urgency about contacting her through the TV or using this platform to reach out to her or her kidnappers. And we don't see any of that. So let's listen to Pierce's questions and keep these things in mind. And let's see if we can predict how they will answer his questions. Right. We'll talk specifically about how people watching this can possibly help you. All right. So how people can possibly help. Well, the McCanns are conclusive that someone kidnapped Madeline. So I predict they will be talking about, well, if you see someone, um, strange reported to us, or if you know anything about what happened that night reported to us, and they will not say anything along the lines of, if you are Madeline, if you look like the girl in the photo, call us, right? Because they know she's dead, right? That, that would not even occur to them. They're conclusive that she was kidnapped. Or for example, I predict they won't say, you know, if Madeline did wander away from the hotel, which is possible, uh, she might be in in your basement or you know might have fallen into a hole. Please check along the coastline. And if you see anything or discover any bones along the coastline, right? As morbid as that might be, if you actually believe your child is missing, you want you all possibilities will be open to you. But because they're conclusive, they will not ask anything that does not conform to their narrative, to their script. So that is my prediction regarding the first question. Let's see the second question. And to see also where you think the, the focus of investigation should now be. Okay. And second question, where should the focus of the investigation be? Well, if there are hoaxers, the focus of, of the investigation should be their narrative. And what is their narrative? That Madeline was kidnapped by some mysterious person who they're sure didn't work at the hotel, had no affiliation with the hotel and who they're sure was not one of their friends, which is the sign of a hoax, right? The conclusiveness. So let's see if we predicted that correctly. And so far when we've done this with the McCanns, we've been right. I think we've done it twice now, both times. And that's because the McCanns are not sophisticated liars, which is another reason I think the police, um, the Portuguese police had it right at the beginning, but then were bullied into focusing on tangential things rather than the people they knew did it. With the people, their primary suspects, which were the McGann's. How can people help? If you're watching this interview and you're keen to try and help you in some way in the search for Madeline, what is the most effective way that people can do this? I think it's two things. One, read the book, uh, Madeline. Um, our website has got all the key information as well and contact numbers and key images. So that's uh, www. All right. That is a very concerning answer. So what should you do to help buy our book? So they're more concerned about book sales, it looks like, than actually finding Madeline, which I think is because they know she's not out there. 
www.findmadeline.com um, and we've had lots of information through that. People in the UK and Portugal, we want them to lobby their MPs and governments to conduct the review. And that's the call to action today, really, to try and get that done. Madeline had a very distinctive eye pattern, didn't she? Tell me about that, Kate, in case people see somebody they think maybe Madeline. Tell me about her eye. So Piers is actually bringing up something that I, pre- I predicted a real parent of missing child would say, right? You would say, if you have this odd pupil pattern, you might be Madeline, right? You might be our daughter and whoever's saying their parents might not actually be your parents, call us. Or if you see a girl with that pattern, call us. They haven't said that this entire interview. And I think if peers didn't bring it up, they wouldn't have mentioned it. And that's because they know it's, it's not out there. They know that Madeline's dead. Like I said, they're not sophisticated liars. They're not imagining every con- contingency. They're not putting themselves into the shoes of parents of an actual missing child. What they're doing is they're just trying to point the finger everywhere but themselves. Right? They're not doing that second level that very sophisticated liars do, which is very difficult to do and is nearly impossible which is why no matter how talented of a liar someone is, uh, it's almost impossible to consistently lie successfully in multiple interviews because you will trip up. However, psychopaths like um, Casey Anthony are able to lie very boldly and actually update their lies in real time and very flagrantly with, in under super high-pressure situations. Uh, the McCanns are not like that. So now Pierce said that. Now they're going to jump all over it. I wish he had not prompted it because I doubt they would have ever mentioned it. If I'm honest, we haven't put too much emphasis on her eye because I think you have to be very close to her to see it. But her eyes are slightly different colors and one of them has this brown. How strange. So they're not even emphasizing the one characteristic feature. Also, how do they know... She's not out there and doesn't know she's Madeline McCann and could be looking in the mirror. How do they know no one's close to that eye? It's very bizarre. So they're trying to cover their tracks for not bringing it up, and it makes even less sense that way. I'm flecking it. Um, That fleck is so distinctive, you'd think they'd be bringing that up in every single interview. Right? Right. If you have this fleck in your eye, you might be Madeline. I don't care who your parents are. They might be lying to you. Call us. But you do notice, particularly on photographs, but... A slightly distinctive eye colors and a little fleck. And, that, and uh, do you know if that would still be there if she's not eight years old? I certainly believe that it wouldn't have changed. I think there's been a bit of debate as to whether it's the technical terms of coloboma or whether it's a defect in the iris. I don't think it is, actually. I think it is actually just an additional bit of colouring. She certainly had no visual problems. And if people see somebody they think could possibly be Madeline, who should they call? But she had no visual problems, but that makes sense, right? Because it leaves open the chance that she may have developed visual problems since they last saw her. However, so, right, you know the old classic rule, right? You do not refer, if someone refers to a missing child in past tense, it means they know they're dead. But that is a little bit of a meme because almost everyone knows that, so liars will actually update it. But still, we make note of it when a parent refers to their kid in the past tense. But here it's still concerning because Jerry said she had no visual problems, right, when she was four years old. He's a doctor. He knows she could have developed myopia as she grew older. Which means that she would have to see an optometrist at some point. So someone would be close to her eye and looking directly into her eye. So you'd think they would say in these interviews or on their website, if you're an optometrist and you're you're inspecting the eye of a girl and she's got this fleck, please call us because it might be Madeline. But they don't even entertain that as an avenue um, to allocate any resources or even in their messaging here. When Piers is lining lining it up perfectly for them, they don't pounce on it, which is more evidence that they know she's dead. Right? The, the, The giveaway here is the things they're not saying. The dog that's not barking is the giveaway here for me in this section of the interview. They call. 
should call the police, local police. You know, if they really think it is Madeline, it gets addressed there and then. It's actually quite difficult um, if you get information coming in historically about sightings. So the advice is clear. It should be to call the the local police. But if they could cover all mm. options and let our investigation team mm. know as well, that would be really yeah. helpful. Have there been moments when you've been pretty much confident that you may have found her? Yeah, never. I don't think so, and I don't think we've ever allowed ourselves to to go there. Um, I mean, early on, when there was the odd um, kind of what turned out to be a hoax call, you always have that real hope of this could be it, that it could all just be over. Notice how she says, you have that real hope, putting it in the third person, because it's She's not saying she had, right? It'd be different if she said, I had that false hope or I had that hope and the, the hoaxers tricked me. It's in the hypothetical. I think because she's imagining what would the mother of a missing child do? Well, you would have a false hope and you would be disappointed. So that's what I should say here in response to this question. So when you're analyzing a statement, you a true statements, you always like to hear the first person past tense when someone's recounting something. Anything other than that needs to be flagged. For example, here, where she's saying, you have that false hope. She's not uh, putting herself into the, into the response there. She's not saying, this happened to me. She's just saying, you, that might happen to you. That might happen to a hypothetical mother whose child was missing. So that's what I should say. Right? It's almost like she's revealing her internal thought process right now about how she should answer this question. So listen to how it's in the third person. I found her. You would think the mother of a real missing child talking about that would say, I remember early on hoaxers would call us and say they found Madeline. And it was, I got my hopes up every single time until I just couldn't handle it anymore. It was too depressing. I shut down. Uh, I couldn't take the false hope anymore. It, it hurt more than the not knowing. Something like that, right? So I, I, I is what you would expect. Now listen to how she answers here. It's almost like she's a director talking to an actress on set of a movie about playing the mother of a missing child. Uh, never. I don't think so. And I don't think we've ever allowed ourselves to, to go there. Um, I mean, early on when there was the odd um, kind of what turned out to be a hoax call, you always have that real hope of this could be it, that it could all just be over. Uh, you have this real hope. Not I had this real hope, or Jerry and I had a hope the first few times, or you have this hope. But since then, because of the total emotional roller coaster, really, that we've been on, you try and hold back, really. And a lot of the pictures we've been sent that have been looked at, you kind of know it's not, but you just... You kind of know it's not. Uh, not, not that we got the photos... See, she's saying we when it's something real, right? We got photos. That's true. They got photos. But then when she's trying to picture what a mother of a missing child would say, she said, you know, it's kind of not Madeline. Because she knows for a fact it's not Madeline. So she's being a little bit deceptive when she's saying you kind of know it's not her. She knows 100% it's not Madeline because those photos could not be Madeline because she knows Madeline is in somewhere, wherever her body was buried, right? Uh, in the water somewhere is my best guess, in my opinion. Just need total verification. Do you still talk to Madeline? Do you still have any kind of conversation with her? I do. I mean, I still go into her bedroom twice a day, just really just to open the curtains and stuff and close them at night. Opening the curtains. Opening the curtains. I think she also opened the curtains in the bedroom at the hotel when she was setting up the stage for the her alibi about the kidnapper. Have any kind of conversation with her? I do. I mean, I still go into her bedroom twice a day, just really just to open the curtains and stuff and close them at night. And I'll just have a little word to her. And I still keep my diary, so. Can you sleep okay now? I can actually, yeah. It took a long time because the, the nights 
for the worst. I mean, I'll still have the odd night where if she's very much on my mind and something's upset me, then it's hard to sleep, but I'm sleeping fine now. I mean, there as you said earlier, there have been cases quite recently of girls who just disappeared reappearing. You know, in, in J.C. Dugard's case, 18 years later from captivity. Let me know in the comments if you want me to analyze that statement from Jace, Stacey, what's her name, Dugard. I wonder if her parents did an interview five years later and we could compare how they were speaking to how the McCanns are speaking and point out those differences. I feel like a good video to add to this series before we analyze a new McCanns interview is actually analyzing an interview of a parent whose child is missing and the child came back. So we know 100% of the child was actually abducted. Right? So we know for a fact the parent had no guilty knowledge and compare the McCanns to that parent, just so I could show you the stark differences. Kind of like how we looked at the video of Christy Mack accusing her boyfriend versus uh, Amber Heard accusing Johnny Depp. Right To see the difference between a real uh, accuser and a hoax Me Too accuser. So let me know in the comments if you want me to look at that. And definitely put in some examples. I think this Stacey Dugard would be a good one. For members, I'm going to send you an interview with the parents of Cleo Smith, which I think is very illustrative. Because um, if you were to do body language on these parents, you would think they're guilty. But if you actually listen to their statements, you would think they're innocent. right? So it's a nice example uh, to contrast with the McCanns. Uh, because this parent, these parents, their kid was found like 18 days later. She had been kidnapped. Um, so I'll put that in there for members. And if you like my videos, please do consider becoming a member. It just makes the live chats more fun when you can use the emojis and actually see the, the members only content I drop into the member section. When you see those stories, does your heart, flip a bit do you think there's hope or is it almost like a, a, a knife in your back that Madeline hasn't I think overall it gives you hope I mean you know obviously every day we hope that it's not going to be 18 years as every parent would but at the end of the day it just highlights how easy it is for children to disappear off the radar and to turn up off the radar for ch how easy it is for children to disappear off the radar could that be a completely benign expression? Yes. Yes, it could. Could it also be leakage? Yes. What has radar? Uh, boats have radar, right? Submarines have radar. Planes also have radar. But when you think of radar, you think of submarines underwater looking for something or boats using radar when they're fishing uh, to check the depths. Um, and I think that's just a little bit more leakage. How easy it is for someone, Madeline, to disappear off the radar, off any possibility of any boats finding her. It was surprisingly easy. You know, many, many years later. So by that point... Also, if there's more instances of water or underground-related leakage, which I'm sure there are, Please continue to do what you guys have been doing and drop them in the comments because I am, I'm going to feature my favorite ones, I think, after we analyze a couple more uh, McCann's interviews. Like I said, I've, I'm analyzing these on the fly because I think that's the most important skill to learn is how to detect a liar in real time rather than the, the deep um, statement analysis techniques, which can take hours to analyze one page of information, right? In a multi-million dollar case or a murder case where you're about to cross-examine someone, then yes, by all means, you should you should know how to do the deep dives. However, for my audience, for people living in the real world just trying to avoid scams or to avoid manipulation from uh, significant others or from parents or uh, just trying to understand what on the news is real and what isn't, being able to recognize it in real time, what I call deception detection, where part of it is statement analysis, part of it is understanding uh, 
the language of manipulation, for example, like the language of therapy, like we looked at Jada Pinkett Smith, I think this is the most critical skill people need to learn. And how to recognize sadists, a particular thing that I do not like, which is why I came back to YouTube, because I saw so much sadism. Um, I had to come back and, and try to teach people how to recognize it. So uh, I feel like that is the most important skill to learn and why I'm watching this alongside, with, alongside you for the first time, which also means that I'm not going to catch every instance of leakage or every odd turn of phrase or every sign of deception. But I feel like my audience, especially the members, ones who have binged all my videos, and many of you have by now, actually watched every single video. Thank you. I've, I've seen in the comments, many of you said that you're, you're in the process of doing it, or that you've completed it. Um, I think that's the best way to absorb my skills. I feel like you guys, uh, guys and ladies, when you watch these videos, can pick up on things that I missed on my first watch. And I, I love it when you put them in the comments. I get the same like, oh, eureka moment that you guys get when I point something out when I read your comments. So definitely please continue to do that. Point many people would have written that child off for dead and it just shows you how wrong it can be. Let's see again. What's she saying? Gives you hope. I mean, you know, obviously every day we hope that it's not going to be 18 years as every person. I notice how she says it gives you hope. Whenever it's talking about any sort of um, hope or, you know, we kind of thought it looked like Madeline. Whenever there's, she's talking about something where Madeline might be alive, she puts it into you. She puts it into the hypothetical. She separates it from herself because she's not describing her own thoughts. She knows Madeline is dead, in my opinion. So when she says, you know, we received photos, she puts it in the we, right? Or I, because she's taking ownership of that statement because it's true. But then she switches, right? We receive photos, but you kind of think it's not Madeline, right? Kind of think because she knows for a fact it's not Madeline. So she doesn't say I. She puts into that hypothetical you. And even here when she's talking about hope of finding your child alive, again, it's in the you. Your parent would. But at the end of the day, it just highlights how easy it is for okay, overall it gives you hope. Flip a bit. Do you think there's hope? Or is it almost like a, a, a knife in your back that Madeline hasn't? I think overall it gives you hope. Right, it gives you hope. Not it gives us hope or it gives me hope. Because they know for a fact there is no hope. Madeline is dead. So it gives you hope. Right? It might give you hope, Pierce, because you don't know whether she's dead or not. Or it might give you this hypothetical character I've created of a mother whose daughter is missing. Um, it gives you hope. But as far as myself, she doesn't say it gives, she did not say it gives me hope. I mean, you know, obviously every day we hope that it's not going to be 18 years as every parent would. But at the end of the day, it just highlights how easy it is for children to disappear off the radar and to turn off the radar. There's that leakage. And I feel like there's a little bit more leakage here. So um, hopefully you guys pick up on more stuff. Every single video I've done on McCann's, you guys have picked up extra stuff that I missed up you know many many years later so by that point many people would have written that child off for dead and it just shows you how wrong it can be i think the strongest thing for us is the public consciousness that these sorts of abductions children are found and that is more important and it's really important not to give up on madeline you can't give up and then we've got to keep her image out there and who knows how she'll be found whether it be recognized obviously we want to try and track the abductor I mean, there's a, a tiny... Once again, the abductor, the conclusiveness, the narrative. I'm sure if I read that book, it would all be about talking about this abductor. Rather than describing Madeline's unique birthmarks or her unique eye flex, things that could actually help us find her. Find her. I feel like that book, if I were to read it, is 100% about covering their asses and focusing on their narrative and pointing people towards some abductor who will never be found. If you've read the book, let me know if I'm right about that. Any chance, I guess, that Madeline might be somewhere where she may see this interview? You never know. You don't know who she's... See, Pierce is bringing up all the things that I mentioned, right? So earlier I said, if I were the parents, or you would expect parents of a missing daughter to look into camera and say, Madeline, if you're out there, if you're a little girl and you have this fleck in your eye, you might be Madeline. 
They never, they didn't bring this up. They didn't bring up the fleck in her eye. Piers is the one bringing this up. He has to, it's like pulling teeth to get it out of them because these things are not occurring to them. Why? Because they know Madeline is not out there looking at the TV. Right? They can't even imagine it because they know the truth. So they're not even pretending. Right? They're unable to um, pretend because they can't even picture the premise to begin with. She's with or where she is. If she was, what would you say to her? I'd certainly say, Madeline, we're still looking for you. And if you get a chance, tell the police who you are. Okay, what would you what would you say if you had the chance? I'd just say, you know, we love you, Madeline. Um, we're not giving up. Uh, we're still looking for you. If you can, let somebody know, honey, and we'll get you home. Well, I, I just hope you keep the faith and that she turns up. I think everybody does. It's been a, a harrowing time for you. Uh, can't even begin to imagine what you've been through, but I really appreciate you spending the time with me. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. So that was part four. That's the end of that interview with Piers and the McCanns. I think that was a great interview. It's broken up into four parts, so you can find all the parts here on this McCanns playlist. And while we, I will continue to do videos about the McCanns to refine our theory. I've had lots of requests for more true crime, so I've put this on my community tab about who you guys want me to add to the rotation of true crime stories that we are investigating on the channel. If you're a subscriber, you can go in here and vote. And the options are Nicola Bully, Amanda Knox, Summer Wells, and JonBenet Ramsey. Um, so I am open to doing some more true crime. I think this McCann series is only going to get better. I will look for those interviews where they do individual interviews, which I think will be extremely telling. But in the meantime, please vote here so we can start adding a new case to the rotation, a new uh, series to start analyzing while we do the McCanns and all Jada and Marilyn Manson accusers, so all the other ongoing plot lines. And also, if you've not joined um, and become a member, please do. It's where I put extra content. And it makes the live streams more fun when you can actually be recognized as a member and someone who's actually learning their deception detection skills from my videos and from the extra content I'm putting in here, which is a little bit more into the the meat and potatoes of uh, the skills. Until next time.